morning, everybody. We're going to give just everybody about a minute or two to hop on the uh, webinar this morning. Um, so we'll wait about two minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. If you're just joining us, uh, we will get started in about a minute or so. Uh, we're just going to give folks um, a little bit of time to hop on the, the webinar today. All right, I don't see our numbers climbing anymore, so I'll go ahead and, and get today's session started. Um, welcome to today's class. Um, today we're going to be covering water saving turf options um, and turf substitutes. Um, the webinar will be about 45 minutes with about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, go ahead and ask questions in the Q&A box if you have questions for me or Steve. You can just go ahead and directly message us through the chat option. SCV Water, who we are. We are a full service regional water agency located in the Santa Clarita Valley. We do provide water up to, to folks about 273,000. Um, the number has increased slightly, so that's about, about right. If you haven't heard, well, we are in a drought. Um, we did designate watering days. So if you have an odd address, those are your watering days. If you have an even address, uh, those are your watering days and then no watering for anybody on Saturdays. If you have, um, if you wanna see more about that, go to droughtreadyscv.com. We do have many rebate programs as well that you can um, find on our website. So I highly recommend just taking a look, um, especially after today's class um, for some of those rebates. We recently um, released a new uh, plant-friendly guide. Um, I highly recommend taking a look at it. It does give you 50 native options and then 50 non-native options that, do, that will do well. Um, so I highly, highly recommend that. I will drop that link in the chat um, so you can take a look at that as well. We, have our, we continue to have our Water Smart workshop. Um, you do get a $20 credit on your bill if you complete the program. I mean, you'll go and do your own audit through your own home. Um, so I recommend signing up for that if you haven't done it already. We still have our smart irrigation controller rebate um, and it's a rebate of up to $150 and it helps you because it, you won't water if it's not necessary. Um, and you can program it to water on your watering days as well. Um, we do have the new and improved landscape replacement program. We do give you um, $3 per square foot. Um, and you can even earn a little more if you do like, um, we have a few pilot programs attached to that. Um, so I, I recommend looking into that if you're interested in adding native. So you get more money if you just use native plants. Um, so I recommend it. We still have the help program, rebates of up to $175. Um, if you convert, so if you convert your sprinkler system to drip irrigation um, or to high efficiency nozzles, um, the watering restrictions, um, those are some exemptions. If, if you have high efficiency nozzles, you, you're not limited to just the 10 minutes or five minutes per cycle. Um, you are able to water a little bit more because it, it's less water at uh, a much slower speed. <clears throat> So we will be doing all of our Zoom, all of our classes via Zoom through December, 2022. <clears throat> we haven't decided for 2023 what that will look like, um, but if you have questions, um, please go ahead and contact me. Uh, my email is there and I will go ahead and drop it in chat box option as well. Um, this class is being recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel in about a week and our website, um, but follow us on social media to stay in the, um, in the know of what we're doing. Our next gardening class will be October 15th and we're gonna cover perennials and natives for the Santa Clarita Valley. Um, so go ahead and register for that as well. I'll send the link to, 
to you as well if you're interested in that. So go ahead, Steve. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off. So I need the option to share the screen here. It's not letting me share yet. Do you have to stop sharing? All right, now let me try. There we go. All right, welcome everybody to uh, proper turf care and turf substitutes for your yard. And as Laura said, thank you again, Laura. If you have any questions, type them into the uh, area in the bottom and we'll get to those very shortly. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. Now, what is grass, turf grass? You know, it uses the most water in your landscape. In a landscaped area, three quarters of the water that you apply goes towards grass because it needs more than trees and shrubs otherwise. And of course, Laura was talking about changing your landscape to natives and drought tolerance. And that's the big movement now to really help conserve water. So reducing the amount of water is the best way that you can do to in these days where we have this high water demand. And you've seen in the press the, the stories of what's going on right now. It's, um, it's, a, it's a real issue. So um, um, functional turf grass, uh, of course, is turf grass that you need to have for children to play on and pets to use perhaps, and utilizing those areas is still great, but we can take many of our other areas back and use turf substitutes. But let's take a look at turf first. Um, so uh, remember that uh, if you are installing grass, there are versions of that that are very drought tolerant as well. We're gonna talk about those varieties as well. But the way that you water or take care of your turf will affect how it, the health of it is overall, um, the water demand that it needs throughout its life, and hopefully you're, you're not gonna give it stress, but uh, we, there's ways that it can take more stress in situations of high heat and low water use. And of course you wanna have the best looking lawn that you can. So let's go ahead here, types of turf. We have two general categories. We have cool season grasses, which are evergreen. Uh, these would be like your marathon lawns, the taller grassy bladed turf that stays green year round. We need more water to water that type of turf especially in the summertime. Your warm season, season grasses uh, go dormant during the wintertime. They, they turn brown. St. Augustine would be an example of that. But overall, they use 25% less water than do the cool season grasses. So uh, as far as a choice is concerned, that would certainly save water in your landscape. So a little bit about root systems. We have different types of uh, roots that grasses have. Uh, we can have a system of roots that uh, has stolons. And the stolons creep along the, um, the surface of the soil and they then along the way will form a new plant that will root in and start growing as well. And so these adventitious roots along the way form new plantlets, new root systems, and they continue to grow. So um, as far as we'll see in a moment what types of uh, grasses have this type of system, but as far as common grasses, um, we have weeds, grasses, we have strawberries, we have lily of the valley would be examples of plants that have this same type of rooting system. If you've ever grown strawberries, you know that as they grow, they form little baby plantlets along the way that root in. There's an example of a stolon system. So rhizotomaceous or rhizomes. Rhizomes um, continuously grow. They um, have this horizontal or sometimes under the soil surface of uh, rooting that takes place along the way, gives rise to new roots, and um, then we get new, new plantlets there as well that form a whole new plantlet too. So uh, rhizomes more below the surface, the stolons above the surface, and let's go forward and take a look at the types of plants. So here's our cool season grasses. Uh, these are very popular because they look good year round. They said marathon would be an example of that. And, uh, Rye grasses, uh, Kentucky blue grasses. So, but these tall type of fescues are the populars, the, the marathon types. And as we can see, um, during the springtime, they have this wonderful um, growth going on. In the heat of the summer, their growth is a little bit less. And then in the fall, they grow a little bit more again, but then they are evergreen during the winter time. As you can see, the roots grow uh, in correlation with that upper growth. So when we have the, the faster growing period during the spring and in the fall, the root system is also growing much faster. 
because roots do grow uh, uh, in conjunction with the upper growth of a plant. So these turf type tall fescues again include the marathon, medallions and centennial are some of the brand names that different growers have. And these can be applied or installed as a sod. And then you can, if you have areas that have need repair, they oftentimes do have seed to use for repairs, but usually these are installed as a sod lawn. Remember that these tall type fescues use the most water. They look good year round. Um, uh, so um, now the color is, is gonna be green. They're gonna use less water than does a rye grass or a blue grass mixed, but still they're gonna be using much, much water. So um, these in comparing again, the marathon, the tall fescues, the medallion and centennials to those blue grasses, uh, as far as fertilizers are concerned as well, they don't need as much fertilizer. They have more disease resistance. They can be very deep rooted. And um, so on these, uh, again, I'm really talking about the, the tall, fescues, uh, the, the marathons, medallions, that they want to have the mower blade set very high, up to four inches, the tallest setting that you can put on your lawnmower uh, so that those blades can have that full growth. Remember, the roots are growing in conjunction to the length of the blades. We don't want to cut them short. Now, this is in particular during the summer months when it's hot. We especially want to raise those blades as high as we can so that they'll also shade the soil and prevent uh, loss of water from the soil. They'll help shade it and act as a mulch. So longer blades um, on your summer uh, marathon type of grasses will then shade the soil, save water, and uh, be a healthier grass. It's going to have a longer root system as well. So we never want to cut any more than one third of a, a grass blade length when we're mowing in the lawn as well. So keep that in mind. Never cut off more than one third of these tall type fescue grasses. It'd be a hardship on that grass. So here's a picture here showing a tall fescue. And as you can see, it's a beautiful lawn that's green year round, um, setting those blades higher. And it does take a little bit more water than does some of the types we'll be talking about next. So the warm season grasses here. The warm season grasses, um, particular, we have your uh, Bermudas, but one that's very commonly used would be a St. Augustine, but there's hybrid Bermudas. There's a more turf type common Bermudas. There's one called Zoysia. And then there's a option called Buffalo grass. Now Buffalo grass actually comes out of the Midwest and the University of California has uh, done research and developed a variety called the UC Verde Buffalo grass that works very well here in the Western part of the United States. And um, it has a, uh, that same uh, warm season grass where it does its growth during the spring and summertime and has its most growth. Then it goes dormant during the winter and turns brown. You can also see that the root growth uh, during this warmer time of the year uh, is in conjunction with the length of the blades of the grass. So winter time, it goes dormant. You can see the root growth is, is really cut back. Uh, it then is ready in the springtime to come back and, and regrow. So hybrid Bermudas are ones that work very well. They're adapted for our climate here and they are used. Uh, now, the difference between these and your, um, your cool season grasses is that the, the blades are gonna be much shorter when you mow these. It's not gonna be that four inch height typically. So it's a very durable grass to use here. It, um, it does go dormant during the winter, as I said. It can hold up against drought. It can take full sun. They don't do well in the shade. So these really want to be in a full sun situation. And um, again, watering issue, we can use much less water than we can on the cool season grasses. They have good disease resistance. A, they can recover quickly from injury. And uh, with fertilizing, which is important, um, they um, you can do this, you know, just twice a year, spring and fall, they will then do well. So in general, grass needs to have nitrogen. It's the most uh, important nutrient for grass and turf areas. Nitrogen is a water soluble nutrient. So as we water, it actually flushes and work its, works its way through the soil. That's why replenishing it just twice a year is uh, usually plenty for our, our turf grass areas.
So uh, this hybrid Bermuda then can be quite aggressive in its growth actually. So having some sort of a border or edging to prevent it from growing into areas that you don't want is oft times really important. Um, we can also with this type of grass develop what's called thatch, which is a buildup of dead roots and um, grassy material that should be removed or renovated annually. We're gonna show you in a minute how that works, um, at least every couple of years. Uh, mowing these grasses regularly every five to seven days in warm weather. And again, the grass, uh, the mower blades are set much lower here, one quarter to one half inch. And the best mower to use for this is what we call the real mower, uh, where the blades turn around uh, um, and they are gonna give you a nice close cut uh, that looks really good on this type of lawn. So here shows you the hybrid Bermuda. Uh, it does having a nice fine blade, which can spread and, and can be mowed much shorter and have a good appearance, of course, noting that it's gonna go dormant during the winter and turn, and turn brown. I mentioned St. Augustine, another warm season turf that is uh, <clears throat> used in, they say in lower quality areas, but it's one that can take uh, more traffic perhaps and hold up uh, to higher, higher use. I have used that in my uh, area here in my garden. I no longer have turf. I've removed my turf entirely here and have a drought tolerant garden, but it's widely used, and especially in those um, high use areas. So it has a coarse, coarser texture. It does have a thick stemmed stolon. We were talking about the stolons earlier uh, that are right above the surface there. It can handle salt spray, so it can be used along the coast. And uh, St. Augustine can take more shade than some of the other uh, warm season uh, grasses. So it's used in beach areas because of this ability to handle the salt spray. And it can take a closer mowing as well, half an inch uh, usually. Regular fertilizing. Now, again, how much is regular? I really like to go with the twice a year personally, but some folks may do it a little bit more often, perhaps during the growing time, uh, spring through summer might be as often as every month or month and a half. So as I said, uh, it does during the winter time, lose its color and starts to turn brown, usually a little bit before the hybrid Bermudas. Uh, there's another uh, grass, um, could we call it more of a weed, Kikuya grass. You know, sometimes folks will have a grassy area that started out as a St. Augustine and over time, other things mix in with it. We'll call it what Heinz 57 that has a mixture of many different things. But the difference then between the St. Augustine and the Kikuya here, you can see that on the left, the St. Augustine has blunt tips on the edge, doesn't have any hairs on the blades of grass, whereas the Kikuya has pointed tips on the edges of the blades, and there's actually little fine hairs. So you can get down there with a, mic uh, a, a microscope or uh, a lens and take a look at that and see the difference between those blades and, and uh, distinguish and identify those. But basically, they're both going to be the warm season type of grasses. And oft times we do end up with that, that Heinz 57 mix. So there's that St. Augustine that has been cut. And again, we can cut this a little bit shorter than we do the, uh, the uh, cool season grasses. Now, here you can see the edges of these blades um, look a little bit brown and a little bit ragged. In reality, you want to make sure that your lawnmower has sharp blades so that when we make a cut, we make a good clean cut that's not ragged or jagged. Uh, because if we have an uneven cut on the end of that blade by a dull, um, dull lawnmower, we can actually have a place where diseases are going to enter into that leaf. So um, try to have sharp lawnmower blades to give you the clean cut that you need. So here we are looking again at mowing. Um, having a good uh, looking lawn to look neat and clean, it needs to to be mowed regularly depending on the type of turf and following the guidelines as to the uh, length that you set those blades. Um, remembering that those um, marathon type uh, tall fescues should be much taller, four inches, whereas the other warm season should be much shorter. And a good rule of thumb, as I said, is never to remove any more than one third of the blade of grass when you do mow. You know, this same rule of thumb applies throughout the garden, really. 
in pruning shrubs and trees in the garden, we should never remove any more than one third of the growth. And for many of our plants in the garden, there's also timing. For example, our fruit trees. We want to make for our, our wait for our deciduous fruit trees to go dormant during the winter before we do our pruning. And then again, it's usually this one third rule applies. So turf itself, um, uh, in the summertime when it's growing more aggressively, all of our turf needs to be mowed maybe more often. Um, uh, and so in the summer, it's, it's twice as much as in the winter usually. And some those dormant lawns during the wintertime may not need much mowing at all because they are going dormant. Uh, we don't wanna push the issue, although we do have warm winters here, we don't wanna really fertilize beyond fall and we wanna let the winter time go by the wayside for those St. Augustine and those warm season grasses. Um, so on many of these turf grasses, as we mow, uh, we can alternate patterns. One week we'll mow in one direction, the next week we mow in a different direction. This encourages more upright growth on the blades and gives a better appearance. There's um, certain lawnmowers that are the um, lawnmowers that allow the clippers clippings to stay in place, the mulching lawnmowers. Uh, so depending on the type of grass and how much grass you're producing and mowing, whether you want to use one of these, uh, they uh, distribute the finely cut grass blades supposedly to the soil line, but oftentimes they end up on the surface of the grasses themselves, and it doesn't look real good. So um, the idea, though, is that in doing the mulching lawnmower, you're going to send this business to the soil. It's going to act as a mulch, and mulch, of course, is going to prevent the evaporation of water from the soil and help maintain your, your moisture longer and prevent you having the water as much. So um, there's advantages to the mulching lawnmowers and disadvantages that it might not look as neat. So as I mentioned, um, mowing your grass blades as high as possible, uh, especially in the heat of the summer, because they're going to shade the soil, reduce evaporation. And we have this um, theory of the root to shoot ratio, where the length of the blades above ground uh, is equal or so, so close to the length of the roots underground. And so if you mow the grass blades too short, you're discouraging that healthy root growth that we need. Uh, healthy roots are important during, especially the heat of the summer, to take up moisture as, as much as possible. Also, your nutrients are taken up in that root system. So it's important to keep that ratio as, as tall on the grass blades as you can during the heat of the summer, especially. And I mentioned the, the sharpened blades. You can see here that the jagged edges on the blades uh, cut here um, can present issues with diseases uh, down the road. And uh, these wound, they call this a wounded area rather than that nice clean cut. So keep your, your lower lawnmower blades sharp and it may be once a season, you might get by with every two years, but uh, check them and take care of that. So the buildup of, of roots and dead grass material can present a problem, especially in those, um, the warm season uh, grasses. Um, but in all cases, we can come through every year, every couple of years, and what's called dethatching. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you have enough of that dead grassy root type material near the surface of the soil to bother doing this. But when you do, you can rent one of these machines for half a day and go through that area in this flail, uh, called a flail lawnmower, it comes through and rips that dead stuff out. So then you're gonna come back and you're gonna rake all this business up. Uh, the lawn's not gonna look good for a while, but then it's gonna recover and it's gonna be much healthier than it had been before. So dethatching is done in the fall and depending on the type of grass and the how buildup, how much of a buildup that you have, just how often and uh, whether it needs to be done at all. Um, so then, um, th again, this is organic material that does not decompose and break down. And uh, when it's about an inch thick is the time in which you want to remove it. It may be, be a couple of years, um, October, November, December. Now the warm season grasses, um, recommend you do that in the springtime, just before they start to green up. And again, uh, you want to see that there's about an inch of that material there before you bother doing this, but uh, it is a worthwhile thing to do for the health of the turf. Thatch removal. 
Aerating is another way that we can improve our turf. If you have heavily compacted soil, heavy clay type soil, uh, where oxygen doesn't penetrate very well. Again, we can rent a machine that comes through and removes a plug. And it removes this from the soil area and then allows better penetration of nutrients and water, uh, oxygen to the root zone. Uh, so um, the cores that we remove are one quarter to one half inch in diameter, usually a half inch, one inch to four inches long, and they're spaced two to six inches apart. Now, after we remove these plugs, we want to come through and rake all those off of that area. Don't leave them there. Remove them. Then we come back and we want to apply um, a complete fertilizer. It can be applied to fill into those plugs. But as well, we want to utilize a, a mulch and something like a Kellogg's topper that is a very fine material or very fine compost that we want to rake over that area to fill in those plugs that we have here. And uh, then we're gonna continue to water. We have developed then a, a zone where the roots can have uh, better access to nutrients, water, and oxygen. Um, so um, this is a really great thing to do. I think aeration, if you have heavy clay soil, is a really important factor to, to consider every two to three years. Uh, you know, a sandier, well-drained soil doesn't uh, require this, generally speaking but definitely the dethatching is something to consider for all of your, of your turf areas. So we mentioned fertilizing and nutrition. Um, so in order to have a great looking lawn, um, they benefit by having extra nutrients. Now we mentioned the mulching lawn mowers. The idea behind that is as well behind, beside putting a mulch layer on the surface of the soil, that cut uh, lawn that you have placed at the surface of the soil is also high in nitrogen and puts that nitrogen right back to the plants. But we can give them additional nitrogen. As I said, it's a water soluble nutrient, whereas the other nutrients stay in place. Nitrogen flushes through and needs to be replaced more regularly. So uh, to have good growth and color in your lawn, good green color, um, how often do we do it? So we say a couple of times a year, we don't want to over fertilize. Too much isn't a good thing either. And organic fertilizer, um, of course, are slow released are, are the best options rather than a synthetic fertilizer. Phosphorus is another nutrient that helps roots and shoots of the plants in their development. And then iron will help keep a nice green color, especially during the warm months. In fact, uh, we need to have warm weather for, nitri for iron to be utilized by plants. In the cold winter time, Iron is not utilized. It needs the heat of the soil to uh, make it utilized or available to plants. So uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron um, are going to give you that beautiful green lawn, but don't overdo it. Because if we do, we're going to have excess growth as well. So here we see a bag of fertilizer that is a 10-10-10, which is a, a good um, complete fertilizer here that will give you the three primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, you may want to supplement with an additional iron. You know, there is some research that's saying that uh, uh, potassium may help turf through times of drought stress. So that's uh, important to make sure that we do have that potash, potash or potassium in our fertilizer that we apply to our turf. So yes, we're talking about how wonderful and how to take care of your turf areas. And yes, it's wonderful to have it for children to play on, perhaps for pets or just around a patio area. But keep in mind that uh, in these times of, of drought, which looks like it's gonna be with us, we're, you know, we're in 20, year 22 of a, the long-term drought in reality. And uh, it doesn't look like it's gonna let up anytime soon. And as we go into the future, um, the needs for uh, irrigation, for agriculture, population growth, are going to continue to, to rise. So um, yes, turf uh, is great in some areas, but there's substitutes that we can use that use uh, even less water and maybe have even less maintenance as well. So let's look at a few of those. Here's one that's come into reality here the last few years. And um, uh, I teach at Mount San Antonio College and several of my students have used this very successfully. Um, 
carapia is what it's called commonly. Lipia nodifolia. So the carapia uh, is a ground cover that uh, can grow to about six inches if you don't mow it, one inch if you do. It was developed in Japan and uh, each plant will spread about six feet. So it's very durable. It will handle ground cover, walking traffic. Um, it, um, it has these small leaves in, in clumps. It does have a small flower in May through November that could be pink to white. And depending on how you, whether you mow it, uh, if you mow it short, of course, it's not gonna have the flowering as it would if it were taller, but it might in, induce flowering. So the benefits of the, the mowing of it, of course, um, uh, you'll want to fertilize it during this time. It will help then get it into a strong root system. Uh, Carapia has a very long root system. Um, we'll see here in just a moment. It can take full sun to part shade. Uh, it's uh, used as a ground cover or as a turf substitute anyway. It can take a variety of soil from well-drained to heavy clay soils. We want to plant the plugs 18 inches apart. Uh, how it's commonly done is by plugs, but you can buy it as a sod that would cover the entire area, depending how big your area is uh, and, and budget-wise. You know, the thing about installing a, a lawn or a ground cover by plug is you have to deal with the weeds that grow during the meantime. Whereas placing a sod lawn or a ground cover in, you have uh, instant coverage and you don't have to worry about weed situation. So um, this carapia here attracts bees. Uh, we do, again, if you mow it regularly, it's not gonna have the flowers and it won't have the bees as it would otherwise. It's great for erosion control on slopes. Uh, it does like to have a border as do some of our, our turf lawns so that it won't spread. So making sure you can contain it. It uses 60% less water than our cool season grasses do. It can tolerate dog urine, it's pet friendly. Uh, I said it can take foot traffic. So this is a really a, a surprisingly wonderful um, use of a plant for a ground cover. I mentioned the root system. Uh, the roots of these can uh, go to a depth of three, three and a half feet or so. Um, if you have the top portion allow it to grow taller, then of course it's gonna have a deeper root system. And for hillside erosion control, as you can see, with that long root system, it's gonna hold that hill together. So it's really a wonderful, wonderful um, choice these days that uh, is being widely used more and more. It's not native. So um, that's one drawback and it's not gonna provide as much for native wildlife, but bees do love it. So it will attract pollinizers to your garden. So here's another one here, the potentilla or the cynic foil. And uh, it grows to a height of three to six inches and spreads 15 to 18 inches. So again, keeping in mind when you plant it that uh, it will spread and cover a bigger area. Uh, originates from Europe. It's durable and can take some traffic, not as much as the carapia. It has small leaves and small clumps as well. And it has these uh, beautiful metallic yellow flowers in the spring uh, and early summer. So it likes to be mowed in that early springtime that will promote new growth and new blooming then that will then give you that beauty throughout the heat of the summer. Uh, it can take full sun to part shade. It is slightly susceptible to mites, and mites are small insects that uh, suck the juices out of plants. Um, there are some controls for that. There's good mites to eat the bad mites, for one thing. Uh, always looking at ways to use beneficials to control problems. Rust is an airborne fungal disease. Um, there are new products out on the market that are biological fungicides, which are very safe and I'm having good results with those and they're easily available as well. So it could be used as a ground cover or as a, as a turf substitute. Uh, it's good in maybe a transition area where you're going from sun to shade um, in an area from grass, let's say to hillside and you wanna have a transition from sun to shade. It does like to have well-drained soil and spacing those plugs 12 to 15 inches apart, it will fill in that area then totally over time. And you know, um, um, in general, we talk about plants growing, uh, whether it be a native plant or a ground cover. Uh, the first year it sleeps, um, 
the second year they creep and the third year they leap. So it takes about three years for ground covers or plants to fill into an area to a space. So here again, there's other varieties of the potentilla that are more shrub-like than more upright um, as well as the ground cover cynic foil that we, we commonly use. So another one, another choice here would be the zoysia or the Korean grass, bump grass are other names commonly used. Uh, growth of six inches to 12 inches will spread about 12 inches. So when planted, note that. And that's what gives it its bumpy appearance is that the plants themselves are higher where the dome of the plant is and then lower in between. So it is difficult to, to mow or to trim back in any way. Um, it's what we call an unusual grass that has a fine texture. It's native to this mascarene island. And um, here's one in a pot here, but uh, I can take full sun, half shade, um, once established, low water use, uh, does go dormant in cold weather. But you know, our winters now are becoming much milder. Uh, I don't know about frost that you've had in your area, but frost is something we're seeing less. Although this last, this last season, we did have a late frost and it froze many of my seedlings, but um, it is a great ground cover or turf substitute um, for use in an area where you like that kind of mounding look. It could be at the base of a larger plant and an Asian type of garden. We oft times use the, the Korean grass. Grass has a nice uh, accent to that. Uh, using it among rocks and boulders as well, where it can grow amongst those has a real natural look. So here we see the fine texture of the grass blades because it is actually considered a grass. So we see a tenuifolia or Korean grass. Another choice here, an ornamental strawberry, the Frigerian. So height of six to eight inches, it will spread 15 to 18 inches. Origins are North or South American, our area here. It is a relative of the edible strawberry but if you've ever eaten one of the little berries, they really don't have very much flavor at all. So they're hardly worth eating. Um, dark green leaves form this nice mat. They spread by this stolen, again, kind of across the surface that sends in new roots, and then you form a new little baby plantlet. Um, mowing the plants back uh, in the springtime um, will remove the dead material that's there. Then it will get new growth does prefer well-drained soil. Uh, it can take droughts to a certain degree, especially once it's been uh, properly acclimated and grown to develop a deep root system. And remember to help develop a deep root system, we don't wanna overwater our plants. We wanna water them deeply, let them dry out somewhat so then the roots, will, the roots will reach down through the soil for that water. And then we'll water again when needed and then wait in between the roots are then reaching down to achieve that water. And that's how we can help develop a deep root system. In my own property where I have um, shrubs and trees, I've trained my trees and shrubs to be watered about every three weeks. And I water them deeply uh, every three weeks and um, they're both ornamentals and edibles and do well. Again, I don't have any grass or ground cover anymore. So the frigeria, the ornamental strawberries, again, can take some drought once they're established can be used as a slope cover, turf substitute. And again, we can have issues with rust, which is an airborne fungal disease. On the underside of the leaf, you'll usually see these little red or orange pustules, and that indicates rust. And there are certain plants that are susceptible to this, including uh, even roses. Uh, so these could be planted 12 to 15 inches apart, and they will again spread and fill in. There's also other varieties available that have different colored flowers. When I was uh, taking classes, I remember that we used to plant the pink panda in a hanging container so that then it would start growing or spilling over the hanging container with these pretty pink flowers. But uh, there's lipstick with red flowers, red ruby, dark pink, and a variegated one that has a cream variegated foliage and then white flowers. So here's another plant that will be commonly called the blue fescue, the pestuca. Um, height six inches to 12 inches, spread six to 12 inches from Southern Europe. Um, tufts of grass that have this blue, bluish gray like color. Now I, I really am fond myself of 
that bluish gray color in a landscape. There's some cactus and succulents that take on this cast as well. Um, so some folks, when it does get more mature, it turns kind of a dark gray that isn't as attractive. And then at that point, you cut the plant back and it'll get new growth. It does send out short little flower plumes that can be pink or white, but they're kind of insignificant flowers. They aren't that obvious. Um, it's a nice feature because of the contrasting that bluish gray color in the landscape. Good for borders, ground covers as a turf substitute. Uh, can be used in containers or at the base around other large plants. Be sure that we don't overwater, particularly during the winter time when the soil is colder. And they're planted 12 to 15 inches apart so that they have room to fill. So there are again named varieties. Elijah Blue is one that really works best in most, land, most landscapes. Uh, here's another one, Bloss Silver, which is, has more of that silvery blue color, gray blue. Siskiyou Blue, which is a taller growing variety, one to two foot tall. Gazanias. Uh, so gazanias are um, a ground cover that uh, from South Africa. At six to 12 inches in height will spread 12 to 15 inches. There are a group of plants that there are many hybrids that have come along and they're used because of the flowering that they have. You know, one thing that's really important that they need to have well-drained soil. In heavy clay soil uh, can be an issue over time. They get very woody. So their um, flowers come in shades of yellow, orange, red, pink, and white. Uh, the flowers tend to close up at nighttime and then open up during the day. And overcast days, they close up as well. They respond to light. Um, they, again, need that well-drained soil. They need the hot sun. Um, they'll grow in the shade, but they just won't bloom as well. So they're good on slopes. Uh, they can take reflected heat from a building. They can be done used in mass plantings. Um, but, you know, here's the thing about mass plantings. I have to make a statement here that personally, um, I think that having one plant material, whether it's a grass lawn or a ground cover, that's all the same, is rather boring. Particularly looking at a hillside of all one ground cover isn't, doesn't have much interest, doesn't provide much for wildlife. Instead, using a variety of ground covers in like a, a patchwork quilt type of pattern, as well as medium and taller growing shrubs on that hillside is much more interesting and will provide more for wildlife as well. So that's my personal opinion on that. Um, here's gazanias again in some of the named varieties. The Leucolania uh, is a trailing one, uh, yellow or orange flowers. Moon glow, a double yellow flower. Mitsui yellow has a low thatch buildup and has a yellow flower. Copper king, deep orange flower and is more of an upright flower on that. So your clumping gazanias are um, used as ground covers in many different situations. Another one here that is a favorite um, is Daimondia. Daimondia margarite is um, show, uh, very slow and short growing, uh, two to four inches, planting them 15 to 18 inches apart from South Africa. Now it says very durable, but yet it does not really take much foot traffic. So, um, but it's durable in other uses here in rock gardens, around stepping stones. Um, it really does better once it's established in very dry areas. Overwatering can be a problem once it's established, okay? But when we do irrigate, we'll, we'll water deeply and then it will dry out in between. Um, the leaves are, are uh, kind of gray green color. Um, and I'm going to show you a close up here. They have a whitish color on the underside. So it almost looks like they have an edging of white. They have a small yellow flower. Uh, so you can see here, it almost looks like there's a white edging, but it's the underside of the leaf that's white. The little yellow flowers um, can be showy, but um, they're really they're during the warm season that we see them mostly. So they're good in a hot area. They can take reflected heat. They work well between stepping stones, but not so much to step on the plants. Uh, planting them 12 inches apart, they will fill in, as I said, within about three years. And there's another picture showing the yellow, yellow flowers and the white under, underside of the leaf along with the green top. Very attractive, I think, for a very low growing plant that uh, doesn't need much maintenance. So Daimondia margarita. Uh, Armeria, Armeria, uh, or commonly called sea pink. 
uh, height is three inches to 12 inches, uh, spread of six to 12 inches. It's from Europe. Um, the leaves look like grass. It's not technically a grass, but it resembles such. So the little pink flowers though are very lovely that it has uh, little globe like round flowers that grow on a, on a stalk or a stem. And it looks like a clover, comes in shades of pink, white, rose, and red. And again, a nice addition to a mixed type of a garden. Uh, heaviest blooms are in spring and early summer and occasionally year, year round as well. If you cut off those um, stems with a weed eater, um, that's one way to trim it back. And, you know, removing spent flowers on a plant will encourage new blooms. Why does a plant flower, whether it be an annual plant or a perennial plant, the reason they're flowering is to reproduce themselves, to make seed. So if they have successfully formed a mature seed, then they're going to slow down or stop flowering. So once that flower is spent on either a ground cover or on a rose plant, if we remove the spent flower, then the plant will continue to flower as it keeps trying to reproduce itself for a longer time and we can enjoy the flowers even more. So that's why it's important to deadhead your plants in your garden. Um, these as well need excellent drainage. They respond to fertilizer regularly and um, Sometimes they become too crowded and we have to divide them actually because there's too many plants. But planted in mass or in a mounded area and used as a turf substitute as a border in a rock garden is a very effective way to use the, the sea pinks. So um, here we see then there are some main varieties as well. Uh, rubra folium, um, red winter foliage and pink blossoms, uh, apple blossoms, pale pink, cottontail has white flowers, Nifty Thrifty is a variegated form with pink flowers. So Myoporum, Myoporum um, Pacificum um, grows about two foot in height, the Parvifolium three inches to six inches in height. So we're finding the Parvifolium is being used uh, more as a turf substitute because it is shorter and uh, doesn't grow as wide, but it's a shorter, so it takes less maintenance. Uh, they originate from Australia, rapid growing ground cover, uh, covering a wide area, quick coverage or establishment on a slope. Um, the leaves themselves are have translucent dots in them. So if you take that leaf and hold it up to the sun or to light, you can see little holes that look like a stained glass window almost. The flowers are usually white, but uh, they, again, they're not the important part of it. They're very insignificant. Demands good drainage. and um, uh, thrips can be a problem. Another pest that we have that is a sucking insect that will suck juices out of the plant. So uh, there's treatments for that that we can do as well. Planting them 36 inches apart, they will cover an area and give quick coverage. So there are some name varieties as well. Kuta Creek, which is more upright. Burgundy carpet has kind of a red stem, which is attractive. And pink with pink flowers. So Myoporum species. Thymus or the thyme, mother of thyme here, a height of three inches, a spread of 24 inches, and it's from the Mediterranean. A very compact plant, very low growing, aromatic foliage and leaves. And you know, there's many thymes that we can actually use for cooking. Uh, flowers of uh, shades of white, pink, red, purple, or lavender. The mature plants will benefit to be sheared down occasionally with a weed eater, for example, then to encourage new growth. Uh, Well-drained soil, uh, it's good ground cover used between stepping stones or as a turf substitute at the base of other plants, full sun, and space those plantlets uh, 12 to 15 inches apart to spread. So you're a mother of time. Um, here we see um, albus as the white flowers, the puccinium, purple red, and the creeping pink as pink flowers. So for more information, um, Laura's telling you, of course, uh, the contacts for the water company itself, but she gave you other information for specific information about drought tolerant planting and choosing plants for your garden. So I'm going to stop the share here and I'm gonna see what kind of questions you've left for me. I guess I can do it right from this screen, let's see. You know, Green Thumb, asking whether Green Thumb Nursery sells carapia. They probably do at this point in time. If not, I'm sure they could order it. 
Um, it is something that is available nursery wide and becoming more so all the time. There are um, growers that are growing it in large quantities for ground cover purposes. Again, depending on whether you're going to um, use it at, by plug or as entire coverage is, is depending what your budget and how big of an area that you're covering as to what, how you're gonna sure. actually apply it. Okay, let's see here if there's anything else here in the chat. No, just the information that Laura's left for you. Are there any other questions? I'm gonna go ahead and stop this share. And... Um, there, there are a few questions okay. coming in, Steve. Here we go, I see now, good. Um, so um, there was mention in this lecture about changing out your nozzles on your spray irrigation for your lawns. So there's these uh, new nozzles that you can use. And like Laura mentioned those that use, they put out less water at a time. So you run them for a little bit longer. The, the good part about them is it allows the water to penetrate into the soil better. And in overall, they're using up to a third less water overall. And there's actually, um, I'm not sure, Laura, if you have rebates on those, um, those nozzles, those new nozzles or not, but um, they're a great way to reduce your water use or your water output in your spray system for your turf in your garden. Um, as far as rabbits, I don't know about, you know, I have not heard about whether carapia is a problem with rabbits, but many of those other ground covers are not a, an issue. Uh, I'd be more concerned with crappy because it's more fleshy like, but that's one thing I'd have to check off. I don't have an answer for that. Any other um, questions? Well, I don't see anything else coming in. Any other comments, Laura? No, I think that that's about it. Um, thank you to everybody. Steve, thank you for joining us this morning and for sharing your knowledge with us. We appreciate it. Um, I will be sending out the PowerPoint to anybody. If you're interested, please go ahead and send me an email. My pleasure. Thank you.